British House of Commons is in recess until mid-June. Prime Minister's questions, usually seen at this time, will return in two weeks. Next, a BBC Newsnight interview with British Prime Minister Tony Blair. He sat down with Newsnight anchorman Jeremy Paxman for a series of interviews at 10 Downing Street earlier this month to discuss foreign policy and domestic policy and his core political beliefs. Tonight, you'll see two of those segments beginning with Mr. Blair's view of British foreign policy. This aired on Newsnight on May 15th. Um, Prime Minister, it's getting on for nine months since September the 11th. In your conference speech, you talked about the kaleidoscope having been shaken, the pieces being in flux. Soon they will settle again. Before they do, let us reorder the world around us. What has actually changed since then? In Afghanistan, I think a lot has changed. The Taliban are gone, a brutal and repressive regime. They've got the chance of a decent and prosperous future. If you look at what's happening now with the destruction of the poppy crop, something like a fifth of the crop has been destroyed, um, with a street value of around about three times the amount of the heron on the British streets. Um, I think the people there, if you were to talk to them, think they've got some hope for the future again. In Africa, we're trying, obviously, to put together the big partnership agreement for Africa, more trade, um, better aid, um, debt relief, conflict resolution. I think we're on track to achieve that. In the Middle East, I'm afraid um, things have gone backwards. Well, we can look perhaps at some of those areas individually in a moment, yeah. but just on Afghanistan, how long will the Marines be staying there? I don't know. I mean, we'll hand over the, the leadership of the security force um, in the next few weeks, uh, but then we'll obviously stay on in some capacity or other to try and, and help the Afghans to develop their own army and security force. So this is an open-ended commitment, is it? Well, it's not an open-ended commitment, and, and let's you know, not exaggerate the number of people we have uh, in Afghanistan. I think there are around about 1,300 troops now in Kabul. Um, and, you know, I can't say exactly when we'll, we'll get every last one of those out. But I think the work that we're doing there is worthwhile and we've got to stick in with it and stick in with the reconstruction of Afghanistan. You talked about the campaign remaining in place to make sure all our objectives are secure, including tracking down those responsible for terror. Uh, given that we failed to find Osama bin Laden, the campaign has not been a success, has it? Again, I mean, I, I would say, yes, it has been a success, um, but it's not complete yet. And if you look at the Al-Qaeda terrorist network, I'm not saying that they won't still try to carry out terrorist acts, but they have been wiped out, effectively, in Afghanistan. Uh, they're on the run. And but they're... Bin Laden was the top priority, wasn't he? Yes, but, you know, I've got no doubt at all that, in the end, we will um, secure him. Uh, but if you look at what has actually happened over the past few months, I think it would be very hard to say that the Al-Qaeda network is not effectively dismantled today. Do you have any idea where he is? No. None at all? No. Obviously, if we knew where he is, we'd go and get him. But we can't be sure. I mean, the answer is we simply cannot be sure what has happened. Um, people talked um, about post-September the 11th of a conflict between good and evil. Do you believe that there is an axis of evil? I believe that um, weapons of mass destruction uh, are a real evil, yes. I certainly do believe that. I note that you have never used the phrase axis of evil yourself. We, you know, we, we all make our own speeches, but I think the President was absolutely right to say weapons of mass destruction are a real issue and a real evil in the world. I just point out, because people sometimes think I've simply come to this uh, you know, in response to what the US has been saying and doing. Three days after the 11th of September, in my first statement in the House of Commons, I said the next big issue after international terrorism is weapons of mass destruction. And I believe that incidentally. And I think that people can be really um, blind to the dangers of this issue and the capacity of unstable, often dictatorial and repressive states to acquire weapons of mass destruction and ballistic and nuclear mili and uh, missile capability. That is a real threat. But the phrase axis of evil is a silly phrase, isn't it? No, I don't agree. It's a silly phrase. You think there is an axis of evil? As I've said to you, I think weapons of mass destruction That's are another evil. another issue. Well. Do you believe there is an axis of evil? I believe, as I've just said to you, that weapons of mass destruction 
are a real evil in the world. Oh. And I believe certainly that those people that combine together, I mean, look, if what you're trying to do is to get me to use, to rewrite my own speeches, no, I'm, I'm not, not at I'm all afraid to rewrite I'm somebody else's. I'm merely asking you whether you think there's an axis of evil. And what I'm saying to you is that what the president was referring to is the issue of weapons of mass destruction well, and support for international he was terrorism. referring to specific countries, Prime Minister. Yes, exactly. And there are real issues in respect of all those specific countries. Do you think countries. Iran is part of an axis of evil, as he appears to think? I think that Iran, um, in certain of the actions that it takes, has the capacity to threaten the outside world. I actually favor a process of engagement with Iran, but engagement on terms that makes it very clear um, that they cannot carry on supporting terrorist groups or dealing in and acquiring um, WMD capability. As you say, we have uh, relations uh, with Iran. Do you believe that they're part of this axis of evil? As I've just said to you, I think certain of the things that they're doing are wrong and need to be countered. Do you believe that George Bush is right when he describes Ariel Sharon as a man of peace? Well, again, what I believe is that um, Prime Minister Sharon does want to see uh, a long-term solution in the Middle East. I believe he does want to see that, but I don't think we're going to get such a solution unless there is very, very concerted international intervention. Do you think Ariel Sharon is a man of peace? Well, again, I don't intend to use the phrases that other people use, but it, it, do I believe that he wants to see peace in the Middle East? Yes, I do believe that, actually. But I also believe that if we're going to get that peace in the Middle East, we are going to have to take an entirely fresh attitude. Do you believe that, as George Bush claims, Yasser Arafat has betrayed his people, his phrase? Well, I do believe that he's let down the Palestinian people. Yes, I do believe that, because I think that there was a, a deal on offer from Prime Minister Barack some time ago that should have been accepted. And I don't believe that the Palestinians have done all that they could to bear down on the scourge of terrorism. So, you know, Do you, you think know, you he's can put betrayed me, his people, though? Well, I mean, to betrayed his people is, is uh, uh, one way of putting it. I think what I would say to you is that he, if he is to deliver for his people, he has got to enter into a proper negotiated process and they have to, once we help them with the capability of addressing these security issues, he's got to address them. So, you know, you can sit here and put to me phrases that President Bush or other leaders have used all day, and I choose my own phrases, and I you speak in my own way, but I believe that the American policy um, of engagement in the Middle East is the right policy. But you choose your own phrases because actually there are significant differences between the way this country views the world and the way that George Bush's administration views the world. Um, I don't believe there are really significant differences, no. Do you agree with him on Iraq that there has to be a toppling of Saddam Hussein? I certainly believe that getting rid of Saddam would be highly desirable and it's always been the American policy to get rid of Saddam Hussein. That and doesn't we, mean to say they're about to launch military action. We endorse the policy, do we? I certainly endorse the policy of doing everything we can um, to get rid of Saddam Hussein, if at all possible. Everything we can, including military means? That depends, as I've said many times. If the inspectors are allowed back in by Saddam Hussein, would you still favor toppling him? Well, if he lets the weapons inspectors back in, unconditionally, anytime, anywhere, any place, then of course that, that uh, makes a difference to the situation, but there's absolutely no sign that he's prepared to do so. But if he were to do so... Well, then let us wait and see if that eventuality happens. But but that, that's what you want him to do. Publicly, we're saying we exactly. want the weapons inspectors back that's, in. And that's exactly what President Bush has said, too. And if he does, we would then cease to think he should be toppled. No, if he does do that, then the weapons inspectors have got to go back in and be allowed to get on and do their job. But, you know, don't let's be in, under any illusions about this. For 10 years, you know, he has been in breach of United Nations security resolutions. You know, for 10 years, the weapons inspectors should have been in there, done their work, but, the weapons should have been destroyed. But this is, this is absolutely key to how he uh, might be persuaded, uh, if persuasion is possible. Yeah. If he lets the weapons inspectors in, does he still get toppled? If he lets the weapons inspectors back in, of course that makes a difference to the situation. But let us see whether he does that, and what is more, um, let us see if but, the weapons inspectors are able to get on and do their job. But there's absolutely no sign at the moment that he's prepared to let them in um, unconditionally to do the work that they should have been doing over the past few years, but have been but, prevented from doing. But again, that is not the American position. Yes, it is the, the American, the American position. position is, George Bush, I've made up my mind that Saddam needs to go. That has been the American position for years, 
Uh, that has been the position under President Clinton it's not your too. Position, though, is it? My position is that it would be highly desirable if Saddam Hussein could be got rid of. But, I certainly agree with but that. You haven't made up your mind that Saddam needs to go. I have certainly made up my mind, as indeed any sensible person would, that the region and the world, and most of all the people of Iraq, would be in a far better position without Saddam Hussein. If you then make the leap, does that mean that military action uh, is imminent or about to happen? No, we've never said that. No. We've said, but, here is an issue, it has to be dealt with, we will deal with it, but how we deal with it is an open question. But you're not then acting in good faith, are you, when you say that he has to let back in the weapons inspectors? No, we are, because I've just said to you, I mean, that is the very demand that we make upon him. And of course that would make a difference to the situation, but they have to be able to go back in there and do the work that they were able, that they were supposed to do last time, but were unable to do. Would military operations against uh, Iraq have to, in your judgment, be endorsed by the United Nations? They have to be compliant with UN law, as we did the last time. Whether that needs another specific UN resolution is not an issue yet, because we, do not sim we do simply do not know what military action we might or might not take. When are you going to publish the dossier of evidence you have? When we consider it right to do so. But it currently exists? Oh, there's masses of evidence about what Saddam's up to. I don't think anyone why, why, is in any dispute why? about that. You said you were going to publish it. And no, you yeah, haven't. we didn't give a specific time. We will publish it. But if I was to start publishing it now, you'd probably think we we're about to take action next week. Or not. So when you publish it, we're about to take action? No, I didn't say that either. <laughs> I merely said that, that we do not intend to publish it now, but we will publish it at the appropriate time. However, if anyone wants to see what Saddam... Hussein has been doing over the past um, decade and indeed before then, they didn't need only read the weapons inspectors' reports that are already in, in the public domain and published. I mean, this is a person who, after all, he has killed tens of thousands of his own people, including by chemical weapons. He started the war against Iran, in which a million people lost their lives. He invaded Kuwait. He is even now in the situation of developing weapons of mass destruction, in breach of every Security Council resolution there is. This is a thoroughly bad person. If you're talking about evil, I think it probably is personified in Saddam Hussein and the regime that he runs. Now, does that mean that we're about to take military action? No. It means that weapons of mass destruction are an issue. Saddam Hussein is an issue. Uh, it would be far better if he was not leading Iraq. The whole of the world would be safer if that were the case. But we have taken no decisions on whatever action may follow as a result of those principles. The reason people worry about uh, your relationship with uh, George Bush is that it seems when, it, when push comes to shove that the United States will just please itself. When you look at matters which can directly concern the well-being of this country, for example, the Kyoto Climate Change Agreement or uh, steel exports, the United States will just drive a coach and horses through any kind of international agreement it finds inconvenient. I, I don't agree with you. I really don't agree with you. I, what is true to say is that the US will look after its own national interests as other countries do. Yeah, now, we, there are, we don't yeah, break but agreements on. like that. Well, hang on. Let, let's just take it step by step. In respect of trade, yes, there is a big battle between the EU and America at the moment over steel. However, there have been many such battles in the past, some of which Europe, frankly, has been on the wrong side of. That is, you know, that's simply international life. On Kyoto, there is a difference of opinion. We've made that clear. But if you look at the big issues, for example, let me just take three issues. How we dealt with Afghanistan, done by an international coalition. George Bush acted in a measured, sensible way throughout with international support. Russia, the new relationship with Russia uh, and NATO that um, we here and others have pioneered and is now coming to fruition. Massive change and step forward. The relationship with Africa, for example, where the Americans are now part of this G8 process to form a new partnership with Africa. Now, I think those things are very, very, very important indeed. Um, does that mean that we will always agree on absolutely everything? No, of course not. I mean, that never happens. But I just I, I want to say this to you because I believe this passionately. People who try to pull apart Britain and America or Europe and America are doing a disservice to all of us. I mean, I, I you, passionately believe that. Well, you know what the accusation is. They say you're a poodle. Yeah, of course. And, and that's what people do because what they want to do is to pull us apart to say to people, you have to choose between somehow your relationship with Europe, your relationship with America. I totally, fundamentally dispute that. We are stronger if we're a partner of America in Europe, and we are stronger um, but, with Europe if we are a partner of America. You talk about standing shoulder to shoulder in the old cliche with the United States. Other people see them just walking all over you whenever they wish. 
But uh, in, in respect of what exactly? Well, uh, take steel, for yeah, example. Yeah, steel. I mean, as I we say, we stand shoulder to shoulder. They. I don't, but we have a dispute over steel. You know, th th there have been trade disputes before that have gone both ways. Are you disappointed in American behaviour in instances like that? Well, I disagree with what they're doing on steel, as I've said before. But the idea that that then means the whole of the British-American relationship should be set at naught is absurd. You know, what unites us is infinitely more important than what divides us. And in this war against international terrorism, in the engagement with the world, it is of fundamental importance that Britain works with America. In issues like the Middle East, it's of fundamental importance sure. that we work I together. Mean, but steel is British jobs. Of course. Um, and it's an American jobs too, so you've got a trade dispute. You had a trade dispute the other way between Europe and America a short time ago, but I think it was Hushkits or some such thing. I mean, there are trade disputes that go on the whole time. The point that I'm making to you is that there are people, often Eurosceptics here, who would like to say, you should be with America, not with Europe. And there are also people who want to say, you should be with Europe and not with America. And I tell you, and I believe this before I became Prime Minister, I believe it with all the passion of five years' experience now in the job. That is a fundamentally mistaken position. Britain should be a big player, strong player in Europe, and we should be um, fulsome partners of the United States of America. So there is a distinctive uh, British uh, foreign policy. Does it have an ethical dimension still? Of course it does, yeah. How then can you uh, publicly endorse a country which bans political parties, bans trade unions, and uses institutional torture? The country being Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. We have a huge you relationship. a friend of the civilized world. Yes, but it is also important to realize that if we want, for example, to secure progress in the Middle East, we should work with Saudi Arabia. Now, you know, I, I don't decide. An ethical foreign policy doesn't mean to say that you try and decide the government of every country in the world. You can't do that. You I'm called afraid. it a friend of the civilized world. It is, in my view, what it is doing in respect to the Middle Chops East now. Chops people's arms off. Well, uh, they, have their, they have their culture, they have their way of life. We have to we respect have ours. that. I'm not saying that we agree with these things. Of course, we don't agree with them. What I am saying is that if you look at the context of what's happening in the Middle East at the moment, it is important that we are partners with Saudi Arabia. And I would simply say to you um, that a extremist political regime would be a lot worse for Saudi Arabia and for the world. Why do you describe um, General Musharraf, who overthrew the government of Pakistan, also as a friend? Because um, he is, of course, committed to returning the country to democracy. That is important. And until he does so, then Pakistan remain um, not in the councils of the Commonwealth, as you know. Um, but what he has done post September the 11th has been very important. And it's important now. If India and Pakistan were to go to war with each other, I mean, just think of what the consequences of that should be. Do you or really be. believe that he is um, a man of courage and leadership? Mishara? I do actually think that he was very courageous. I said those words after September the 11th when in the face of what could have been an enormously difficult situation in his own country, he decided to back the coalition against terrorism rather than the Taliban. That was an act of courage, and I can tell you, because I went there shortly afterwards, it took a lot of courage on his part. You see, people just find it rather odd that you can endorse Saudi Arabia and its regime, or General Musharraf, whose taking of power we actually deplored, as being consonant with a foreign policy which has an ethical dimension. Yeah, but I didn't say to you that I endorse, I mean, for example, in respect of President Musharraf, we made it clear we expect Pakistan to return to democracy. What I am saying we to you, neither Saudi do I... Saudi Arabia to become a democracy? No, but I, as I said to you a moment or two ago, I do actually believe that the peace initiative they put forward in the Middle East recently has been extremely important, and I welcome that. Look, when people talk about a foreign policy that is, you know, based on certain values, I certainly hope that it is. Does that mean that in every single situation, you know, you, you can have perfection? No, but what it does mean, I'll give you two examples of what I would call a foreign policy based on values. Sierra Leone, where this country didn't need to, but intervened and helped a country that would have been taken over by a gang of gangsters and returned it to democracy. Kosovo, where in the face of a lot of people telling us we were naive and foolish, we actually made sure that those refugees could return to their country. We got in the end, rid of Milosevic and Serbia. Now the whole of the Balkans is moving towards Europe uh, and away from conflict. So uh, does that mean that in every single situation I agree with all the policies of every government I deal with? Of course not. I mean, that would be absurd. Let's turn to the Euro. Uh, you've said that the uh, tests will be uh, applied 
probably after a couple of years of this government. That takes us to next summer. Could they be applied sooner than that? We simply made no decision on when they should be applied, but they have to be decided by June 2003. How soon after that could a referendum happen? Again, that's a, an open question. Uh, but, I mean, our commitment is, if the economic tests are passed, then we will put it to the people in a referendum. Now, I can't start specifying to you the weeks and, or months within which that will happen, but obviously once the tests have been passed, then it's a, a live and active issue. It's getting close. Yes, it is, yeah. Do you have any idea of what public opinion feels about the euro? I mean, I think there are obviously uh, divisions in public opinion, aren't there? I mean, you, you know, you, you, you can see that as, as, as well as me. On the other hand, I think that people do believe that if the economics are right for the country, if it's right for jobs and industry and investment, then they are prepared to listen to the argument for, for joining. And I believe, you know, I've said to you before that I'm, I'm uh, a huge supporter of our relationship with America, but I think that Britain's destiny is as a leading player in Europe. I've no doubt about that at all. A leading player in Europe doesn't necessarily mean being part of the euro. It doesn't necessarily, no. Um, if the economics were wrong um, and you, you stayed out, people would understand that. But if you stayed out for political reasons, I think people wouldn't understand that. And in my view, if the economics are in the right place, if the tests are met, then it is overwhelmingly in this country's interest to join. How is Gordon Brown's review of the tests going? Has he updated you? Of course, we discuss it the whole time. So when you're at a But if you forgive me, not, yes. we don't, we discuss it with each other, but not necessarily with, with you. Why not? Well, at some point we will, but you know, I mean, I didn't mean that person incidentally at all. Not at all, don't worry. I'm not bothered, but I mean, it's just curious as to why it's all so secret, that's Well, all. it's not secret, but it's just, it's, uh, you know, you, you, well, what I've learned with this issue is that you, you see? speculation <laughs> runs pretty wild, whatever you say about it. But look, we're looking at something that's going to happen next summer, a matter of, what, 12, 13 months away. Mm -hmm. The fact that you won't talk about it... Well, I am prepared to talk about it. I'm just, I, I'm sorry, I was simply saying I'm not prepared to disclose not... whatever discussions we're having on the tests and how they're progressing, because you just set a whole lot of very unhelpful speculation away. So when you're at a meeting of uh, European leaders and they say, well, Tony, are you going to come into the Euro? What do you say? Can I phone a friend? Uh, no, I say what I've just said to you, <laughs> that if the economic tests are possible, put the people in a referendum. And they accept that instantly. They think that's an entirely sensible position. But you must have a timetable. Well, we do. I mean, I've just said to you, I mean, it's June 2003. The tests have got to be assessed before then. That's what, what, why, why we said before the election, we do it early in the next parliament. You have a timetable for the test. You must then have some sort of timetable for a referendum. Well, I mean, I don't, we're not in the position of taking a decision as precisely when you'd hold a referendum after that. But I mean, let me sort of truncate the discussion for you. I mean, if the tests are passed, then of course, I mean, you, you, you will be putting the thing to the people in a referendum. Are you not going to... How quickly? Well, as I say, it's not been decided uh, precisely how you would do that, but I don't, I don't think there's an issue about a gap then. I mean, once the tests are passed, then it is in the interest of your economy, so we believe that you go in. It could be a matter of days or weeks. Well, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, uh, exactly when you would hold the referendum. Remember, there's Months? got to be legislation. Well, there's got to be legislation through Parliament, but I, I'm not going to speculate on, on the precise timetable. What's the longest amount of time it could safely <laughs> be left? I, I, there's really no point in speculating on it. I mean, there's not an issue there. If the, t the, the key date is not actually how long administratively it takes to get the referendum bill and so on. The key decision is if the economic tests are passed, are we going to then recommend it to people in a referendum? And the answer to that is yes. And I think the most important thing is to explain why. Uh, and the reason for that is that if it's right for British jobs, British investment, British industry, it's the right thing for us to do as a country. But once and you've made that decision, you want to act upon it fast, of course, don't yeah. you? Well, you, you will certainly want to act upon it, yes. Okay. I mean, what, what you're asking me to do, and I simply don't want for, for, for reasons that aren't, uh, that there's no mystery in it, I simply don't want to pin myself down on a particular period of weeks or months. But if the test is the actual passed, date of the referendum, because as I say, sure. you've got legislation and you've got various discussions that you would have to have. But we so. could expect a referendum perhaps next year. Well, I, I'm not going to speculate. I'm really not. I'm sorry. Looking at where you stand in the great sweep of British Prime Ministers, 
Why do you want to go down in history, possibly, as the man who surrendered the pound? I don't want to go down the history um, as that person, but I certainly believe passionately that this country and its destiny lies in Europe. And I believe that for 50 years, we had a foreign policy in this country where we would say, it won't happen, this European cooperation. Um, then we don't like it when it is happening. And then a little bit later, oh, okay, we'll join in. And that's been the pattern of British involvement in Europe for 50 years. That is not a British attitude to me. But Britain is a strong country. Britain takes positions. Britain is a country that says you know, we can lead in certain situations. And for us to be in the situation where Europe really until we came to office uh, was, was totally isolated within the European community. I mean, when I first, I remember the first um, uh, intergovernmental meeting I attended in Amsterdam in 1997. I mean, we were completely isolated without a proper voice, without any strength in the European Union. Now we're leading debates on economic reform, on defense, playing an active part in the future of Europe and the debate about the institutions of Europe and on economic policy. We, we have a totally changed set of relationships with the rest of Europe. Now that's good for Britain. So when you say, is it about surrendering the pound? It's about the British national interest. And I believe the British national interest is to be a strong part of Europe. And you would have no problem with history recording you as the man who killed the pound? I would have no problem with history recording me as the person who said to the British people, it is in our interest for us to be a key and major player in Europe. And here is something that is in a single currency is in our economic interest to do so because people here expect me I think to stick up for British jobs and British investment and British industry um, and you know this the, 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 the basic you know and what's fascinating to me too is if you look around the world today the whole of the rest of the world is moving closer together if you look at what what's happening in America north and south with the, where they're thinking now of trying to create this huge free trade area if you look out in Asia where they're actually talking now about possibilities of single currencies and so on. If you look at these 10 countries queuing up to get inside the European Union, the whole world is moving closer together. Now, what should we do as Britain with all the strengths of our history? Should we stand apart from the alliance right on our doorstep as a country? I mean, it'd be crazy to do that. So whether we join the Euro or not depends on the economics. You've got to have that in the right place because it's an economic union. But we shouldn't, for political reasons, stand aside. And I don't believe that would be a fulfillment of our national interest. I actually believe it would be a betrayal of our national interest. Prime Minister, thank you. Thank you. We continue with the BBC's Newsnight interview of British Prime Minister Tony Blair. In this segment, he discussed his core political beliefs and the differences between his new Labour Party and traditional Labour Party views. This aired on BBC Two's Newsnight on May 16th. Um, Prime Minister, do you accept that many people think you have no core political beliefs? I accept that people say that, yes, for a very obvious reason, which but is that uh, they can't often handle the concept of new Labour as opposed to traditional Labour Party views or old-style socialism. But when you have someone who was as elevated in your party as the deputy leader, Roy Hattersley, talking about a vacuum at the top of the party, that is a serious and pretty damning criticism, isn't it? But I just totally disagree with it. If, if you look at what we're doing, strong economy, jobs for people, investment in our public services, education the number one priority, tackling poverty, third world aid and debt, but 45% increase in real terms in the levels of, of, of uh, aid and development, money for the third world. What, 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 why is minimum wage, trade union rights and representation? Why, why aren't these things that Labour leaders are strove for for years. Where I simply don't agree with Roy and others is that you need new means of tackling these things in today's world. It's not that I don't believe in the values of social justice, community, opportunity for all. I believe in them passionately. But I simply believe that you can't deliver them in the way we did 30, 40, 50 years ago. Roy Hattersley says that um, you keep nibbling at new ideas, stakeholding, communitarianism, the third way. The feeling is that there is only space where his beliefs ought to be. Yeah, but again, I totally disagree with that. All those things and the whole concept of the third way is really derived from the same set of beliefs. That the Labour Party stands for certain values, community, opportunity to all, responsibility from all, a belief in social justice, but that these beliefs should be translated into the world in a different way for today. 
and you know, I've never changed my beliefs on, on these things. Um, I've always believed that. You know, I've always been someone in the Labour Party who's believed that the Labour Party's values are fantastic, but we lost our way, and we lost our way and became a party, you know, enslaved by, by an old-fashioned set of um, ideological uh, concepts that were simply ludicrously out of date for the world in which we were living. And I make no apology for saying I'm a moderniser for the Labour Party. I stood on that basis. It's no great surprise to anyone. Yes, you famously rewrote Clause 4, which was the sort of Ark of the Covenant for the party for many, many years. And which no one dared refer to. Can you just remind us what the wording is of the new Clause 4? <laughs> if you want me to recite it, I'll tell you what it starts with, actually. You can recite it? I can't recite it, but no, I can... No, exactly. No, hang on, but I can start with what it says, actually, which is that the Labour Party is a democratic socialist party. Yes, and it, and it believes in power, yes, it does, that. and power, wealth and opportunity in the hands of the many and not the few, and we should live in a society where there is tolerance and respect. Uh, for people and you know I, I'm not going to give you the exact quotes but that is essentially what it says and that is what the Labour Party stands for and the great thing and by the strength of our common endeavour we achieve more together than we do alone and let me tell you I can quote those words today and so can any member of the Labour Party with pride we never used to better mention the old clause for in case someone accused us of being Trotskyists why was it then that when you were asked in Prime Minister's questions to give a brief <sighs> characterization of the political philosophy that uh, you espouse you said, I, the best example I can give you is the rebuilding of the NHS, the appointment well, of Magda Yaku. I'll tell you exactly why. Because you haven't done Prime Minister's Question Time. No, I have I have, right. Prime Minister's Question Time is a place for many things. For discussing the philosophy of the Labour Party or any other political party, it most certainly isn't. So, you know, the idea that people should say, oh, because you didn't, in responses on Prime Minister's Question, it means you don't have a political philosophy. I've always had exactly the same set of beliefs. And you can track it through every speech I made in the run-up to becoming leader of the Labour Party and every speech since then. Yes, those are all written out, you see. And this well, is the not just written out. The suggestion is that without the, the, without the whole thing being committed to paper and memorised or half-memorised, you're unsure what you stand oh, for. Rubbish. Come on, Jeremy, look. What, what do I stand for? I stand for a Labour Party that believes in opportunity for all. That's why we have... Um, the New Deal for people. That's why we have the investment in education. Why do I think education is the number one priority? Because it's opportunity for people. I know that there are children in this country who could be doing wonderful things and have a fantastic and fulfilling life, but they get a lousy education, therefore they don't get it. That's why I believe in education. Why do I believe in rebuilding the National Health Service? Why have we taken the decision to raise taxes to put money into the healthcare system? Because I think that people should have a decent um, healthcare system irrespective of how wealthy they are. Why do I believe in issues tackling crime and issues like that? Because I actually think, and this is where I do differ maybe from people in the Labour Party in the past, I think these issues are Labour Party issues. I think there's anti-social behaviour, the vandalism, the graffiti, the lack of respect for people. I think that is all part of, uh, you know, a, a, a society that has lost its way and I want to create a society where we have opportunity for people, where we demand responsibility from them. Now, you could go back through all the speeches I made, those off the cuff, written down, not written down, half remembered, fully remembered, and I've said exactly the same. So there may be many criticisms that people may make, and some of them I may feel a lack of confidence on, but I feel no lack of confidence on this one at all. Okay, well, let's, nonsense. Go, let's go back to one of your speeches. It's your maiden speech in the House of Commons. I am a socialist. It stands for equality, not because it wants people to be the same, but because only through equality in our economic circumstances can our individuality develop properly. British democracy rests ultimately on the shared perception by all the people that they participate in the, the benefits of the common wheel. Of the common wheel, exactly so. You endorse every word of that, do you? Well, of course, this is exactly what we're trying to do. I mean, the, the whole... Equality in our economic circumstances. Yeah, it, it, of course. Now, do you... And as I, I went on to say, equality doesn't mean that people are the same. Does equality mean equality of outcome? Or does it mean equal status, which includes equal opportunity? In my view, it means equal opportunity. That's not what you say. You say equality in our economic circumstances. Yes, exactly. It's, which is why people should... How do you get equality in our economic circumstances? Through things like education, access to technology and skills. Um, what I have never believed, however, is, is that you should have a Labour Party which doesn't work with business or doesn't care for enterprise or doesn't believe that you need successful entrepreneurs. Well, equality in our economic circumstances seems pretty unambiguous, but you believe, do you not, in a meritocracy? I do believe in that, although I don't believe that that is sufficient. Squared. No, no, I, I don't agree with that at all. Well, 
If, By look, definition, the meritocracy is not the same as equality in our economic circumstances. It, it, no, it depends how you define equality. If you want to define equality as a quality of outcome, then I agree. If you don't define equality as a quality of outcome, if you define it as, well, I call it often equal worth, actually, because I think it's more than just equality of opportunity, but certainly it includes equality of opportunity, then that is exactly what a meritocracy but, is. But meritocracy is not the same as equality in our economic circumstances. Well, as I say, it depends how you define the equality. And I think you'll find that I actually said at the time, equality should not mean that we're all the same. Didn't I? I think I said that there. I don't have that here in your, in, in your speech, you? but perhaps you did. Equal I think you did. You just you read it out, didn't you? No, I don't think so. Equality not in the sense of us all being e the same. Indi only through equality in our economic circumstances can our individuality develop properly. Yes, but didn't you... British democracy rests ultimately no, on a shared I... perception by all the people. I think, I think you'll find that in the course of the speech I made it clear that it's not simply everyone has to be the same. You made another speech at Tübingen University in which you mm. said the sole key to modern politics was how to manage change. The sole key. Yeah, I think in terms of the political process, that's right, actually, yeah. How is that reconciled with what you've just been telling us? Well, I'm not saying that the values... Um, I'm not saying that the values that you believe in are a managing change. What I was saying was that if you look at the, the challenges facing society today, economic insecurity, insecurity within society, they're all about managing change. And I think one of the great tasks of modern social democracy, and that's what today's Labour Party is about, it's a modern mm -hmm. social democratic party, I think that the, the, the great task is how do we help people through the changes that technology is bringing, uh, globalization is bringing, and the changes in family life, culture, society that people see around them. And I think the role of government today is enabling. It's not the old controlling role of the state, and it's not laissez-faire free market economics. That again is what I mean when I talk about the third way. It's a role for the state that is about enabling people, equipping them to survive this process of change. Uh, in the spirit of commitment to um, equality of opportunity and democracy and meritocracy, the only reasonable uh, House of Lords to have would be a fully elected one, wouldn't it? Um, no, I, I, I don't accept that. Um, I think that, that you've got to ask what do you want the House of Lords for? Uh, is it a, another chamber like the House of Commons or is it a revising chamber? Um, and if it is a revising chamber, I think there is a case, certainly, for saying that you don't want simply to replicate the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And after all, the House of Commons is where people elect their government. Well, I can see why you're not keen on it. I mean, one of the other functions might be to put a check on government. Well, of course it puts a check on government. The question is, how does it do that most effectively? And I don't necessarily agree with you that it does it most effectively by, um, by simply having the same types of people in the House of Lords as you've got in the House of Commons. I mean, look, with this issue, Jeremy, with the best will in the world, once you go through the processes of change, the amount of time I personally, as a Prime Minister, will live with a fully reformed House of Lords will be re reasonably small. I mean, this is something, however, we need to get right for future generations. And I don't accept the premise that the only viable House of Lords is one in which you get exactly the same people in the House of Lords as you got in the House of Commons. Well, they wouldn't, of course, be exactly the same well, people. They'd be different types people. Of, no, types but, of people, though. But what I mean but, about that is... But it should it, at least be, a large part of it should be properly elected. Well, let's wait and see what the Joint Committee... Uh, What's your own feeling about it? My own feeling is that the House of Lords should be different from the House of Commons. Um, and that we should not lose the one advantage of the House of Lords, which is that you get people in from different walks of life who haven't spent all their life in politics and who can contribute a genuine expertise to debates. Now, um, having said that, you, you might possibly be able to achieve that through the elected mechanism. I've got an open mind on it. We'll, we'll see what the Joint Committee says. But not appointed by you, all these uh, people from different walks of life. No, but look, first of all, just let, let's get one thing straight about this. I'm the first Prime Minister who had given up the power of patronage in the House of Lords. You'd think from the things that are written that up until I became Prime Minister, all previous Prime Ministers used to have some great democratic system. The previous Prime Minister has appointed every single life peer in the House of Lords. So I've been giving up the patronage. And remember, in the House of Lords, the Conservatives still have more peers than we do. Let's talk about something which people do uh, clearly understand about you, and it is your sense of a moral, religious um, conviction. I take it that that really underpins more or less every judgment you make. 
after that. I mean, uh, look, I, I, I am a, I'm a Christian, I, I believe in it, but I don't, um, I don't think it's very sensible to start trying to view every decision you take as if it were as a sort of religious rather than a political decision. I mean, yes, of course, it has an influence on my, my life and the values that I believe in, but I don't, I don't wear it on my sleeve. Your life, isn't well, it? of course it is, yes, it, of course it is, but I, 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 don't, I don't like it, to be honest, when politicians make a big thing of their, their religious beliefs, so I don't make a big thing of it. No, I'm just trying to explore the sort of chap you are, mm -hmm. really, Prime Minister, with respect. Um, and the question of your religious conviction is very important. I mean, is it, 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 of course it is, yes. Is but that what it doesn't you... inform every political decision I make in it a doesn't. very narrow way. Well, of course it... Look, I'm a person, an individual with a character, and part of my character is about what I believe in, and part of my beliefs, obviously, is a, is a, is a, is a, a religious conviction. I simply hesitate whenever I get drawn into this territory because I found over time that it, it either leads to people misunderstanding the basis upon which you're taking decisions or it leads to people trying to colonise God or religion for one particular political position. I make no claims to that at all. Is it your religious conviction that makes you tolerant of the idea of faith schools? Um, no, I think there is a strong case for faith schools. Um, because I think parents often like to have their children brought up with, with a certain ethos that they believe in. And I think people should remember about faith schools. We've had faith schools for years in this country. The issue is simply whether we say to the Muslim community, you can have Christian faith schools, you can have Jewish faith schools, but you can't have Muslim faith schools. Now, I, I don't know how I'd, how I'd explain that to them. You don't accept the force of Peter Haynes' point the other day that uh, that will be likely to encourage what he calls isolationism in the Muslim community? No, I, I think that it is actually better to have communities feeling that they, they can have faith schools, which obviously then abide by the national curriculum, than having sometimes people on a more of an ad hoc basis with particular majorities in particular schools. You'd be happy for a child of yours to be taught that it was literally true the world was made in six days? Well, I don't know that my children are taught that. I'm no, not sure that any children are. You would be happy for your child to go to a school in which that was imparted as fact. Well, I don't know that it is imparted as fact. Who, who imparts that as fact? Well, creationists imparted as well, fact. Well, I think, I think if this is to do with the, um, uh, the school up in the northeast, I, I wouldn't believe everything that's said. I think you will find that the school abides by the national curriculum and teaches its children perfectly well. And I may just say, I know there are a lot of criticism of that school. Look at the results. They're pretty good. Most parents will want their children to have the results as good as that. Is it appropriate to teach creationism in a state school? I don't believe that it does in the way that you're suggesting. And I think it's, it's important. I mean, I haven't, I don't have all the particular facts at my fingertips in relation to this individual school, but I well, do know that some of the allegations that were made school, were disputed. Is it, is it appropriate uh, as a matter of principle that creationism be taught but in a state I, school? But I'm not sure that it is. And, and therefore, I, I don't know that it's a, a, that, a relevant respect, question. That's not the question. Well, it, it, it is in the but sense that there's no point in asking me a completely hypothetical question. I don't have any because I, because I don't think they're very sensible questions to answer. Um, I think that the issue of face schools is, to my mind, you, you, you've got to answer it in two ways. Is it right to have any face schools at all? Well, I personally believe that it is. That it's a right for people if they want to have their children brought up in a certain. Um, way and, and uh, Catholic or Church of England schools um, have a certain ethos in those schools, right? That's the first question. But some people will say, no, there shouldn't be any faith schools allowed at all. The second question is, if you should have faith schools or if you allow or permit faith schools, is it right to tell the Muslim community that they're the one community that can't have such schools? If there is a moral element to your uh, philosophy and to your actions in government, how is it justifiable to make poor people even poorer by, as in the case of parents with misbehaving children, taking away their child benefit? First of all, this isn't directed at poor people. It would be directed at those that were falling down on their duty of responsibility for their own children. And secondly, you might as well say that a family that is of a low income should never be fined, should never have any form of its benefits withdrawn. I mean, we don't say that. Are you going to do it? 
Uh, we are looking at it, we're examining it very seriously, because I believe that with a government that is putting massive amount of money into helping young people off benefit and into work, huge amounts of money into programs like Sure Start and Better Nursery Education, making a big investment in our education system, we are entitled to demand from parents some minimum responsibility back for society. And to say, if your children is if your child is engaged in persistent truating, refusing to cooperate, um, and the police and the education welfare officers and the school and everyone is at their wits end, well, I'm sorry, but we shouldn't carry on paying out benefit to you in circumstances where you're not prepared to give anything back to society. That sounds as if you're going to do it. Well, we're examining it. We've got to examine it to make sure it's practical. But as a matter of principle, I think it is right that with benefits come responsibility. What about the idea that is contained in, in uh, Frank Field's bill of uh, removing housing benefit? I support that. I support the idea that if, if you get people who are convicted of antisocial behaviour and who again have had every chance in most of these cases in behaving properly and they refuse to do so and they're making life hell for all their neighbours, then why should the state carry on paying out benefit to those people, subsidising their housing when they're using their housing to inflict misery on other people? And, you know, it's difficult probably for people like us to understand what it's like to live on a, an estate when, you know, you, you, you get one family in an area, and it's not the vast majority of people in these areas are law-abiding, decent people, but you get one family or two or three families that make life absolute and total hell for people. And is, it's just, it's not right. How is making them homeless going to make them behave well, better? Well, you know, I'm afraid in the end, you might as well say, why is it right that you punish anyone for anything? You know, in the end, if people are given every chance to behave responsibly, you've got to protect other people um, who suffer the consequences of Even their responsibility. Even if that means a family becoming homeless? Well, if it means evicting them from the place that they are, and as you know, some families have been evicted with the antisocial behaviour orders, but I'm afraid in the end what happens is in those areas the, the, the other families can live in a bit of peace and quiet. And, you know, I think it's... As you asked me about my beliefs earlier, what, what, what I think... I, and I hope I've done, is in one sense returned to a very old-fashioned um, left-wing uh, uh, idea and, and value. And that is the value of responsibility. Responsibility to other people, which is why it's so important that society takes measures to help people in poverty and lift them out of poverty, but also responsibility to society to put something back. To, to, for it not all to be take, there's got to be some give as well. And I find, you, you know, I, I mean, just to g g give, you, give you an example, I mean, when you, you see, you know, gangs of young people, and again, the vast majority of young people behave well, incidentally, and young people are the victims of a lot of this crime, so we're not stigmatizing all young people. When you see gangs of young people out of control, making life hell for local people, often elderly, vulnerable people, it's not right. I mean, I can't, I don't know how I justify that. And therefore, it's not, harshness or being right-wing or toy or any, of, uh, or any of the rest of it. It's simply saying to people, in the end, society, community, that basic thing that I do believe in strongly, community, it's a deal. It's not a one-way street. It goes both ways, the opportunity and the responsibility. When you go uh, back to those uh, old-fashioned uh, values, how are they consonant with your party taking money from a pornographer? You know, the, the, these funding stories, they come, they go. This is, the, the, these are people who own the Express newspapers. Yes. Right, well, in that case, in my view, it's perfectly acceptable for us to take a donation from them. They also own horny housewives, mega boobs, posh wives, skinny and wriggly. Do you know what these magazines are like? No, I don't. But I do know that if someone is able and fit and proper, to own one of the major newspaper groups in the country, then there's no reason why we shouldn't accept donations from them. And the only difference between us as a political party and what went before is that all the donations are made openly and so that every single thing about party funding is for the first time but, out in the open. But you wouldn't take money, I take it from a tobacco manufacturer, but you would take it from a pornographer. Well, I've said what I've said in that, and I've got nothing else to say. We dealt with it a, a short time ago, and the original allegation, you might remember, is that we'd pushed the... There's no dispute the, the, about through, the money. The, 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 there's no dispute about the money, but the original allegation, as you remember, was that somehow the, the, 
the takeover of this group had been cleared as a favour for this money. No, I'm, like, not, I'm not suggesting that I know that you're not, but people were suggesting that. And once that original allegation was shown to be complete I'm nonsense because the decision was taken by someone else, then they move on I'm to something else. I'm just curious to know how you reconcile taking money from a pornographer with your deeply held Christian values. Well, I've said what I've said on it. Doesn't, when you look at this issue, doesn't the case for some sort of state funding of part political parties become all more or less unanswerable? Look, if I could get shot of ever raising a single penny for the Labour Party ever again, I mean, wouldn't, would I not do it? Absolutely, of course David I would. Blunkett says state funding is inevitable. Yeah, but you can't do it, Jeremy, unless there's a consensus amongst the political parties. You can't, you, you can't have a situation where we as a government use our majority to push it through. I mean, I, and I'm not sure the public would accept it either. So, I mean, I, I, look, I honestly don't know what to do about this. All I know is, when I became leader of the Labour Party, 90% of the funding and more was from trade unions. People shouted foul. We changed it, so we took money from businesses and individuals. We then came into power, and for the first time ever, we've opened up the books so that everybody knows where we get our money from. The reason half these people are targeted is because the press has a list of all the people that donate to us. We haven't the faintest idea not merely what people, but from what country the Conservative Party got their money from in their 18 years of government. All we've had is grief from that as well. Can we move to a different system? Again, I honestly don't know. Um, but it can only be done as part of a general debate in which people are prepared to have a mature look at how parties fund themselves. Because we need political parties. I have to employ people in the Labour Party. You know, every... Um, bit of the money we get, it doesn't go into my pocket or any other Labour politician's pocket, it goes to employ staff and democracies need political parties and political parties can only run with money. And I don't actually want to return to a situation where we take all our money off the unions. I don't think it's healthy either. So I agree, it's a very, very difficult issue this. I wonder sometimes when you sit here in, in, in number 10, you know, one, one day it's donations from a pornographer and another day it's something else. All these events pressing in on you, do you ever think, I've had enough of this? <laughs> well, no, I don't think that, uh, because I think, despite all the rubbish that comes in and out, there are really worthwhile things to do. So you plan to carry on and on and on, do you? N no, no, I haven't said that. I've never said that. Well, I have a feeling you... we were getting to the, when are you about to step down question. Uh, and if we can, again, yes. shortcut no, that, we... I, I'm not saying anything about it at all. But I think... What you've got to do is decide uh, what it is you want to achieve in politics, and that's what should determine your appetite for it or not. But do you plan to lead the party into the next election? I've said that I stand for a full term. And that would be a full term, a well, full third term. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm honestly, not getting in to speculating about it. Please, but... I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm really not getting into the issue of whether I'm a go on and on and on person or I'm about to resign tomorrow person, I'm not. Um, I'm carrying on, I'm doing the work that I'm doing. I think we've got huge challenges still ahead. I have every bit as much appetite for the job as I've ever had. Um, and despite, you know, the slings and arrows, it's a, it's a privilege to do it, isn't it? It's an absolute privilege and I should never forget that. Prime Minister, thank you. Thank you. For more information on British Prime Minister Tony Blair and the British government, on the internet, go to www dot number dash ten dot gov dot uk or write to Prime Minister Blair at 10 Downing Street. For if a jubilee becomes a moment to define an age, then for me we must speak of change. Queen Elizabeth II is one of only three British monarchs to have marked 50 years with a royal jubilee. Look to C-SPAN Sunday, June 9th at 9 p.m. Eastern and Pacific for highlights of Queen Elizabeth's golden jubilee. American politics, our weekly look at the people and events shaping public policy is next. Tonight's program begins with remarks from Tipper